The argument from convergence is based on the idea that the early Christian church was very disparate, with several groups believing in very different things. This diversity then converged into essentially two quite closely related religions, those being the Eastern Orthodox and Western Roman Catholic churches, with other small groupings with essentially similar theology such as the Coptic Church in Egypt. There was therefore a convergence between disparate religious beliefs in the Christian Church onto common themes that occurred over the first three to five centuries. Related arguments consider the early and widespread geographical distribution of Christian communities and the possibility that some Christian communities may have predated the death of Jesus. But here I'll focus on theological diversity and convergence and consider these other questions in different videos. This is not the usual pattern of religious theological development. Usually what happens is a religion is founded by a charismatic leader, begins conformal and then fragments with the passage of time. This characterises the later history of Christianity itself with Catholicism fragmenting into Protestantism and Catholicism and Protestantism further fragmenting into numerous other religions that then went on to fragment themselves. There is no doubt that the early Christian church was diverse. The split that we can see most clearly is that between the Jewish Christians of Jerusalem and Pauline Christianity. The mainstream, i.e. historicist position, is that the Jewish Christian church originated with the disciples and followers of Jesus who were transiently scattered to Galilee after Jesus' death, but then seemed to have regrouped in Jerusalem under the leadership of James, a brother of Jesus. The group formed one of many sects within Judaism, they practiced synagogue worship, worshipped and brought animals for sacrifice to the Jerusalem temple, observed Jewish holy days, followed Jewish dietary rules and circumcised their male children. They viewed Jesus as the Jewish Messiah and saw him as a great rabbi and prophet but not as a god. Jewish Christians, being essentially Jewish, suffered at the hands of the Romans during the 66 to 70 AD war when they were scattered beyond Jerusalem, enslaved or killed. Then the defeat of Bar Kokhba at the hands of the Romans in 135 AD was a further blow to the Jewish people, including Jewish Christians, who were presumably killed, enslaved or driven out of Judea. After a brief reappearance in the 2nd century, the Jewish Christian movement disappeared from history. Saul of Tarsus was a Jew who initially persecuted specifically the Jewish Christians, probably on behalf of the priests of the Jewish temple. Following his conversion on the road to Damascus, he changed his name to Paul and acted as a Christian missionary from around the mid-30s to mid-60s AD. His conversion was not, however, to Jewish Christianity. He formed a new Christian movement, drawing on many contemporary religions from around the ancient world. He saw Jesus as the Word, or a God, and the Saviour of humanity, who was executed, resurrected and ascended into heaven. His revised version of Christianity was necessary for it to succeed in the Roman Empire in competition with other contemporary religions. The Gospels were written after Paul's death and appear to have been heavily influenced by his ideas, more so in fact than those of Jewish Christianity. During Paul's 30-year ministry, he was frequently in conflict with the Jewish Christians and probably also with the other group I will come to, the Gnostics. He eventually fell foul of the Roman Empire, was arrested, taken to Rome and executed in the mid-60s. Many of the churches he founded persisted after his death, and ultimately it was his version of Christianity that triumphed. The third group were Gnostic Christians. Our knowledge of this group is much more sketchy, and it is unclear at what date they originated. Gnosticism was a religious movement that took elements from numerous contemporary religions, from astrology, from Judaism and Christianity. Elements of Gnosticism certainly did date back to before the first century, but all of their literature that has survived, and there is little of it, postdates the first century. The theology of Gnostics was radically different from that of other Christians, and in some ways there was more diversity within Gnosticism than there was between Gnosticism and other forms of Christianity. Commonly held beliefs were that Yahweh of the Old Testament was a defective and inferior creator god, who was basically evil, jealous, lacking in compassion and prone to genocide. 
and that there was a higher, more powerful and benign God at the head of a highly complex astrotheological universe. Gnostics seem to have been very tolerant of religious beliefs from outside of Gnosticism, which is probably one reason why they were so diverse. They also had a notable lack of discrimination against women. Paul himself does not specifically seem to have discriminated against women, but Pauline Christianity later did so, as can be seen in the later pseudo-epigraphic epistles attributed to Paul, like Ephesians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus. Gnosticism was a common belief system in the eastern Mediterranean in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. However, it was bitterly opposed by Pauline Christianity, which ultimately won out, and Gnostic beliefs largely disappeared by the 6th century. These three were not the only early versions of Christianity. There were various other communities adhering to different apostles and with quite widely divergent Christologies as well. The early Christian church was a picture of diversity and struggle in which the Roman Empire saw off the Jewish Christians and the Pauline Christians saw off the Gnostics. So it is easy to understand how convergence occurred. But what's odd is how divergence occurred. The argument goes that this early diversity argues against a central charismatic leader. But the history of the situation does make this diversity quite credible, even under historicity. Paul's conversion seems to have involved a religious experience in which he came to believe in the spiritual power of Jesus. However, he had never met a human Jesus, and he remained at odds with the Jewish Christians throughout his career. In fact, it is argued by historicists that this explains or at least contributed to his silence on the matter of a historical Jesus. The Jewish Pauline schism may not have been down to interpersonal animosities. Paul was a Jew, but his missionary purpose was to convert Gentiles, and he therefore had to form a religion which was acceptable to them. This dictated many of the theological divergences between him and the Jewish Christians, and that in turn may explain the disagreements between the two groups. Paul's vision of extending Christianity to the Gentile population is all that is required to explain the divergence between Pauline and Jewish Christianity, and furthermore, it seems entirely reasonable that this divergence occurred during his ministry, i.e. in the mid-first century. The issue of Gnosticism is more difficult to explain away. With two charismatic figures founding the Jewish and Pauline churches, their origin is easy to understand, but Gnosticism? there does not appear to have been an early charismatic leader or founder, though there were prominent early Gnostics, such as Marcion. There are basically two ways of looking at the Gnostic problem. Gnostics were particularly tolerant of other religious views, and perhaps it is not surprising that they freely mixed Christian ideas with those of other religions, and also that there was such a diversity of belief among them. It may therefore be that Gnostic Christianity was simply the consequence of Christian ideas reaching this particular liberal, free-thinking group of people before Pauline Christianity gained the strength to exterminate them. The other possibility is that Gnostic Christianity was in fact a stage in the process by which Christianity arose. It is clear that Gnosticism drew on beliefs predating Christianity, and freely mixed these with Christian motifs that at the time may have been novel but later became associated with Christianity. Jewish Christianity posed no threat to the Pauline Christian Church by the end of the 2nd century, as the Roman Empire had finished them off. So there was no particular reason for the Pauline Christians to root them out. Gnostic Christianity, on the other hand, remained a threat until the 5th century, so the Pauline Church was much more vigorous at hunting them down and destroying their literature. Hence the evidentiary vacuum we have today. So in the end, I do not think the argument from convergence has much strength when applied to Jewish and Pauline Christianity, because these groups arose and converged by means that seem entirely reasonable under historicity. In the case of Gnosticism, there are two interpretations of what happened. One of them supports historicity and the other mythicism. But I do not think that there is a great deal to choose between the merits of these two cases. So in the end, although the argument from convergence is put forward by mythicists, overall I think it's pretty neutral on the decision of historicity versus mythicism.